We're in a series on the commands of Jesus, and uh, uh, when you were a child, you probably heard a phrase like this, and if you're a parent, you probably have said a phrase like this, and it goes like this, uh, because I said so. <laughs> Has anybody heard or said that? Yeah. It's just, uh, I don't know how you hear it, but I've never really appreciated or enjoyed someone saying that to me. And it'd be very easy to look at the commands of Jesus and, and say, well, Jesus said it, just do it. And yet, uh, that takes away this idea. It makes it all about authority and less about why. What's the heart of Jesus in the commands that he gives us? Why does he call us to respond in certain ways or to do certain things? Is he just looking for some kind of obedience or is there an obedience that yields something? And I think that uh, the way Jesus talked about those things helps us a lot. So we are uh, in uh, uh, looking at the commands of Jesus and today we're gonna look at the command to forgive, the command to forgive. And I know some of you right now are just going, oh, if I'd known he was gonna say that, I, I wouldn't have been here today but you are, I'm sorry, you can forgive me as a result of this message. Uh, this is what it says in Matthew, it says, uh, Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Uh, it's, it's quite a question that Peter asks, and, and in the rabbinical teaching of that day, the number of times you would forgive a person was three times. After that, you didn't have to forgive them anymore. And so Peter thought he was being super gracious. He just, he doubled it and then added one more, seven times. And uh, uh, Jesus says, 77, he's not, and you can tell, like that's 11 times what he just said. Jesus isn't after a number. Jesus commands that we develop a lifestyle of forgiveness a lifestyle of forgiveness. This makes us very anxious because we are seriously concerned that if we keep forgiving people, they're going to take advantage of us. We worry that if we keep forgiving people, it's going to make some things possible that, that we would prefer would not happen. Uh, here's the challenge about unforgiveness. Unforgiveness feels powerful. And if you've been hurt, and you've been wounded, and you feel weak, there's an incredible attraction to being unforgiving because it makes us feel strong. It's like a weapon that we now possess. So we can withhold our forgiveness from someone, and that's a way to exercise power over someone. Maybe we can manipulate their actions or their words by refusing to forgive them. Or, or maybe you have an opportunity to get in a little comment that takes them down a notch or two, or you could treat them a little more coldly because, because they deserve to be treated like that. Or we can withdraw from them altogether. And, and, and maybe we can create an emotional barrier that winds up as being a defensive wall to protect us from people like them. Um, the challenge is, is that we wind up making another person's offense against us our identity. It's not just something that happened to us, it now becomes who we are. We are the person who someone else wounded. And so we wanna, we wanna shame them, we wanna gossip about them, we want to change other people's opinions about them, we, we want to take revenge any way we can get it. And here's the beautiful thing about unforgiveness is while you are taking revenge, you will feel completely justified. You will not feel guilty about it at all. Uh, we would rather feel strong than to forgive. Um, when we make another person's offense uh, against us and we don't forgive that, we may feel powerful, but we're actually becoming weaker in the process. And uh, by the way, if you're interested in studying this in any way, if you want to see where in human history that forgiveness became a value, because what you would probably be helpful to know is that in, in cultures throughout time and throughout geographical location, forgiveness was not seen as a value, it was seen as a weakness. If you want to see where forgiveness became a value that was worthwhile, it begins with Jesus and his followers. That's where in history forgiveness becomes something that's important. So, uh, uh, when Jesus insists that unforgiveness doesn't make us powerful, it actually robs us of power. 
And so he wants us to know what the benefit of forgiveness is. Now, there will always be, there will always be pressure not to forgive someone. And, and not just from the interior part of you where you, you don't want to forgive them, but also people from outside don't want you to forgive them either. Uh, some people believe that if you forgive someone uh, who injured or, or took the life of someone that you love, that somehow if you forgive them, you're saying that person was not very important. I have very good friends who live in Florida. Their son was out riding a bicycle in front of their house. He was run over in a car, by a car, being driven by a person who was inebriated beyond his ability to even walk, that just even remember what was going on in his life. Uh, he didn't even know he hit him. They found the bicycle wrapped underneath the car several miles down the road. Uh, I can't imagine what kind of loss that is, but I do know that God, by God's grace, that couple not only grieved and found comfort in Christ, but they forgave this person. They actually went to his cell in prison and told him, you have hurt us in ways that we do not have language for, and you've taken the most precious thing from us that we could possibly have, and yet we want you to know that because of our faith, we forgive you. He was completely broken by those words, and he made a commitment to Christ himself, and that began, that began a prison ministry that that couple continued on for, for many, many years. And people all through the state of Florida and Georgia who were incarcerated become, became believers in Jesus Christ as a result of their faithfulness. That's, that's what can happen when we are willing to forgive. That's what can happen. Um, some people believe that uh, uh, forgiveness creates victims. If you forgive someone, it just allows people who are abusers and people who injure others to keep doing what they're doing. And some people believe that if you tell people that they should forgive, that you've just added another hurt to their lives and now you're re-traumatizing them. There's a lot of pressure to, to not forgive. There's a lot of pressure. So what are we supposed to do with this? And the answer is, is Jesus calls us to be the kind of people who forgive. And he tells us how to go about it. Uh, I think in our world, uh, our culture values a lot of autonomy. And if your autonomy and your independence is the most important thing, then forgiveness is unnecessary. It, it's a waste of time. Forgiveness only matters if relationships are important, if community is important. If those things are important and we don't have community or we don't have forgiveness, it's only a matter of time before every relationship gets fractured beyond its capacity to continue. Because there will always be something done by someone, even those we love, that will cause us some kind of pain. And so for that reason, in our culture today, a lot of people consider forgiveness to be immoral. We are taught by our culture to act with outrage at even the smallest offense. We're taught that that's the appropriate response. We realize that we can actually gain standing in our society if we can prove we've been victimized or we defend those who've been victimized. And in this mindset, forgiveness is equated with injustice. If you forgive someone, you're letting them off the hook. Do you see the complications created? Do you see why Jesus has to say something about this? Because our own heart, our own nature, and everything about our society and our culture works against this. Uh, this is why politics has actually become less about politics and more like a man-made religion. We're taught to react with outrage to anything that we don't agree with. We're taught that the people who, who disagree with us, they're not just different. They're not even just wrong. They're evil, and they're to be condemned. And so we need to choose grace over outrage. That's what Jesus calls us to. Respectfully engaging with those we disagree and forgiving those who have injured us is an essential part of our faith. I want you to hear that again. Respectfully engaging with those with whom we disagree and forgiving those who have wronged us is an essential part of our Christian faith. This is what we've been called to. I understand it's not part of our shame-based culture, but Jesus is building a new culture. It's the culture of his kingdom. 
And uh, unfortunately, vengeance runs deep in our hearts, and there's a lot of platforms now. Uh, people used to maybe just talk to themselves while they were out working in the field, but now we have access to social media and everybody can know our outrage. Without forgiveness, we will not pursue justice. Without forgiveness, we only pursue vengeance. To think that we can pursue justice without forgiving the person first puts this whole thing in reverse. And all we're trying to do is pay someone back for something that we perceive that they did to us. How many murders in our culture are the result of unforgiveness, of grudges that have been nursed, and the bitterness that exists in people's hearts? Uh, there's multi-generational wars that have gone on for, for decades, hundreds of years in our planet. And at its root, at its very root, is unforgiveness. How much damage does unforgiveness have to do in our world before the light comes on and we go, that's not working. And yet, that's not how we tend to think about it. So Jesus understands our need for two things. One is to be forgiven, and the second is to be forgiving. This is what he calls us to do. Without it, we're gonna feel isolated. Without it, we're gonna feel agitated. And so Jesus understands this is something we need to learn to embrace, to walk in. And since he's the author of forgiveness, since he's the expert in forgiveness, we're going to need to look at him. And Peter says, how many times? How many times, Jesus, should I forgive? Seven times? And Jesus says, uh, yeah, it's, it's not really about a number. It's about a lifestyle. Forgiveness isn't a one-time act. Forgiveness is a way of life. That's how Jesus thinks about it. And then Jesus actually tells a story. I'm trying to save a little bit on time today, so I won't read it to you and then explain it. I'll just tell you the story. And he, talks, he tells a story about a king who had a, a number of servants. And so he finds out that one of those servants was actually uh, in debt to him 10,000 talents of silver, 10,000 talents of silver, just to get a rough idea of, of what that amount is to us. A talent of silver was typically the amount of, per, of money a person would make in the course of a year, an annual wage. And so this person had taken and was unable to pay the debt of 10,000 lifetimes. At, at minimum wage in, in our state, uh, this would result in about uh, 350 to 400 billion dollars. How many already feel better about the money you owe right now? Just, you know. <laughs> and so the, the king calls this person into account. And by the way, he says, how, does a servant, how does a servant rack up that kind of debt? And obviously, this isn't the person who, who sweeps out the stalls where the horses live. Like, this is a very high-ranking official in the king's government, and, and uh, obviously he had access to a lot of resources and, and wealth, and so he's, he's a very important person. And, and he calls the man in, and he says, look, I'm going to have to end this. Uh, I, I, the treasury can't take what you're draining, and so uh, we're, we're going we're gonna to sell you and your family off as slaves. I'll get a little bit of money from that. We're going to sell all your property, and uh, I know I can't recover it all. I'll get something back, and, and that's it. And, and the person begged the king. He begged him. And he told him, he said, have patience. That's a really important word, isn't it? Have patience with me. I'll pay everything back. And the king's heart was moved. He had pity on him. And he didn't just give him time. He canceled the debt. 10,000 lifetimes of debt. Canceled. Gone. In an instant. And the man leaves the king. Can you imagine the weight that's off of his shoulders? Can you imagine going from, I'm going to be a slave sold into servitude by, to, to someone else to now I'm completely out of debt. I have, and he goes from there and he comes across a person who owes him a few thousand dollars. And when he sees that person, he goes up to him and he grabs him by the throat. He says, you pay me everything right now. And the person uses the exact same words that he used with the king. And he says, I'm sorry, I don't have the money right now. I beg you, don't take action against me. I will pay everything back. Just be patient with me. And he says, I will not be patient with you. And he has him thrown into prison. And, and, he, and he says, you're going to stay there until I get every penny back. Well, not surprisingly, the news got back to the king. And when the news gets back to the king, he's not very happy about how this person acted. 
And he says, shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant? And then the king ordered this, you are going to go to prison where you are going to be tortured until your entire debt is paid. And since he can't pay that in a lifetime, that's a life sentence. Then Jesus says this. This is the hardest part of the whole message right here. Jesus says this. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Yeah. Very unsettling. It sounds like, it sounds like what God is saying here is that if you don't forgive, you're gonna be punished even more. And that's not what Jesus is revealing. What Jesus is showing to us is that if we don't forgive, we wind up imprisoning ourselves and torturing ourselves in ways that last an entire lifetime and we never get free. It's not a punishment from God for refusing to forgive. It's the reality that we're building around ourselves. The lock that we turn, that we think are keeping other people out of our lives is actually a lock to our own prisons. It's a very famous line, and it goes like this. Forgive, uh, unforgiveness is the poison that we drink while we wait for the other person to die. And Jesus knows this. So how can we forgive? It's a good question. How do you forgive? And the first thing I would say is you have to name the wrong. This is very challenging for people because we assume that forgiveness it, it, uh, kind of diminishes the importance of the thing that was done against us. Uh, as though forgiveness is, well, it wasn't that big a deal, doesn't matter that much, wasn't that important. Listen, if it wasn't that big a deal, if it doesn't matter that much, if it wasn't important, it doesn't need forgiveness. I mean, nobody gave me a chocolate chip cookie yet this morning. <laughs> forgiveness is not required. That's just not how life actually works. Many people feel they have to minimize something to forgive. When we do that, that's not honest. You will never walk in freedom by, without speaking truth. Jesus insisted on this. You have to, you have to operate in truth if you're going to experience freedom. So forgiveness begins with naming the wrong. You lied to me. You took advantage of me. You stole from me. You abused me. You hurt me. You did something and it was wrong and I don't deserve to be treated like that. Our desire to somehow have a pretend peace keeps us from engaging in actual forgiveness. If there's nothing to forgive, then we don't need to forgive, but we need to acknowledge what has actually been done. And then this is the second thing. We're surprised by this in the story. It says that the king had pity, right? He he, had, he recognized something in the person's heart that he thought was worthwhile. Look for reasons to be compassionate. Look for reasons to be compassionate. This is so hard for us to do because when somebody has hurt us, we don't want to understand them in any way. We, we don't want to connect with them in any way. We, we want to keep as much difference as, distance as possible from them. And so we, if we wait, and this is the thing, if we wait to feel like forgiving someone, we never will. We're going to have to do something before our feelings. And uh, this is a thing a lot of us don't understand. A lot of us are led by our feelings in life. And don't get me wrong, feelings can be great, but they should not be our decision makers. Uh, for example, uh, maybe you don't feel like uh, doing the assigned reading for your class this week, but uh, you won't like the feeling when you fail the exam or the course either. So we have to do something that we don't feel like doing in order to avoid something that we know we won't like. Uh, compassion flows out of connection. The, the pain we experience from the offense will remind us that we're nothing like that person. And we'll say things like this in our head, if not out loud. I would never do that to anybody. I'm always anxious when we think we're incapable of doing to someone else what they've done to us. We have to find something in common because if we don't, there's no way to develop compassion for that person. 
Try to understand what that person might be going through. What fears are they surrendering to? What pain are they operating in and processing? And if we don't do that, we'll never understand them. And then the third thing is decide to cancel, cancel the debt, which is a problem because there's still a debt. You just decided they don't have to pay it. <laughs> what we'll want is, is for them to suffer. And I've seen this, I've been in ministry long enough, not, not as long as some people in Ecuador, but I've been in ministry for a minute. And this is what I've seen is that uh, uh, two family members will be at odds with each other for years and years and years. And, and then one of them will be in an accident or maybe they have a terminal disease and maybe they're in a hospice situation or an ICU room. And, and the person who's been so distant and, 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 and so far from them for so long comes in and sees them and they see them in this emaciated or this broken condition and their heart is broken for them. And they will tell you, they will tell you that they forgive that person and now they can be restored. And what I will tell you is it's highly unlikely that's actually forgiveness. What it more likely is, is now they've suffered enough that the debt is paid. And, and Jesus says that that's not the way to think about this. I'm going to ask the worship team to come out. He says, cancel the debt. Now, when somebody hurts you, you will have the opportunity not just to think thoughts about them, but to say words about them, to speak ill of them. Maybe you'll even have the opportunity to make their life a little bit harder. And every time you think about it and don't do it, every time you will experience a little bit of pain. Because you'll be reminded of what they did, and, and then when you don't bring what feels like equity to that, you'll feel pain. That pain that you feel is the debt being paid by you. And I don't know how long it takes for you to pay down that debt. And it could be minutes, it could be hours, it could be days, it could be weeks, it could be months, it could be years. I don't know, but I do know that when we operate that day, there comes a day when there's no more pain. You don't forget the memory's still there. But the pain is gone and the debt is paid. And instead of trying to bury or injure another person, you've created the possibility for forgiveness. Why do we do that? This is what's so hard to understand, but so important. The reason we do that is because that's what love is. It wants what's best for the other person not just the people we like, not just the people we're related to, not just the people who do nice things for us. Jesus said, you've heard it said to love your friends. I say, love your enemies. What's in their best interest? And consistently operate in that. So this is where it gets confusing and hard. For example, uh, let's say there's a domestic violence issue that continues to go on in a family and, and a person is not holding anyone accountable. They're, they're constantly being injured. And, and they'll tell themselves and maybe other people, I'm just forgiving them. And I'm not suggesting they're not trying to. But, but what's in the best interest of the person who's the abuser in that situation to continue to live a lifestyle of abuse? Is that in the best interest of that person? Absolutely is not. Authority is going to need to be brought into that conversation. And it might be in the form of legal matters, it might be a police officer, it might be some kind of action where an authority that can act, stand in that room and make a difference. Why would we do that? To pay them back? No, 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 no. Because if they continue to live a life of abuse, it's only going to go worse for them and everybody they're connected with. If you really love that person, you'd want them to change. So Jesus says, forgive. And what I will tell you is, we will go, yeah, I, I, I can't do it. And what I will tell you is, you can't on your own. But the good news is, we're not on our own. The God who is the expert in forgiveness, the God who is the expert, taking all of our faults and failures and paying the price for us, experiencing real wounds, real pain, He's the one that comes into our life and he's the one who helps us cancel debts so that there can be forgiveness. Is there anybody in the room that are grateful you are forgiven? Anybody? No. Yeah. Father, thank you. You forgave us. Help us forgive others in Jesus' name.
Amen. Let's all stand together.